Good afternoon, and thank you so much for your valuable time. Um, I realize this is a lunch hour, so um, I wanted to start off by really uh, trying to be trauma informed and welcome you all to grab a drink, grab a blanket, whatever it is that you need to feel centered. Um, I realize many of you are going to be jumping from this call <clears throat> back into work. So I really um, encourage you throughout this training to take care of self. Um, oftentimes we are jetting from screen to screen. And I would also encourage you to stretch, breathe, take a pause. Um, it's really wonderful. These trainings are recorded so you can always come back and review the information. Um, so I really hope that you find this training today useful in a way to help you frame the very important work that you all are doing. Um, <clears throat> so without further ado, I will, and, and I was already introduced, it's really great, but for those that are joining us, um, again, Sylvia Grabel, I'm from LACLJ. Um, we're in the heart of Los Angeles, and um, my pronouns are she, her, Ea, and um, I am a brunette. I have brown hair, brown eyes, and usually a huge smile. So um, I just, I'm not very good with a poker face. So hopefully um, you will be able to note that I'm very sincere about these practices and I am available if you'd like to reach out to our org or myself, if you need follow-up materials and obviously Kasha um, who will be uploading these materials. So without further ado, uh, can we move to the next slide, please? So why are we here today? <clears throat> As many of you know, um, we like to center the work that we're doing around uh, competency, and we can't do competent work um, as legal professionals or individuals in legal settings if we are not um, taking care of ourselves, right? This would be irresponsible. So I know many of you are able to read this and you've seen these before, but I did want to punctuate um, the fact that uh, a rather new uh, competency area or subcategory <clears throat> is wellness. So I'm very encouraged to see that within um, the legal profession, that wellness is now um, being held out as something that's necessary for a competent practice to occur, right? Um, to sustain the work and to make sure that you all are in the best space to be able to engage with, uh, with clients, right? Who very much need your assistance. Uh, next slide, please. move on to our agenda. <clears throat> so when you all decided to join the legal profession, I'm sure there were really great values and um, ways in which you wanted to positively impact, right, society and assist others. Um, <clears throat> justice is high on everybody's, um, you know, list of values, and that everybody have access to that justice, right, or the process um, that will achieve justice. So we like to take a moment to review how professional culture can influence practice and trends in legal aid. Then we're going to uh, discuss um, strategies for adapting these practices to respond to current needs of those seeking legal aid. So <clears throat> We have had people seeking out legal support for quite some time, but the issues, the needs, the social or economic climates have changed. And how does this um, influence, right, these practices? So how can we then change to meet these growing and changing complex needs? Uh, we're also going to discuss how public interest legal aid clinics and law schools can uh, best prepare future attorneys for healthy and sustainable careers in public interest law, right? So in, in doing legal aid, um, <clears throat> I was, first of all, thank you so much for responding to my very specific questions and general ones. Um, but I was very curious if any of you had had training in this area, if you felt prepared and where you gained that, that knowledge or that experience. And many of you listed that it was through your clinics, right? through your internships and clinics that you got to um, see some of these best practices and maybe also practices that were inefficient or highly unsustainable. 
So we'll discuss that um, a bit later on. And then the role of mentorship and supervision in creating new professional norms. So <clears throat> I would say being an attorney is up there with one of those professions, right? When people think of it, they're like, oh my gosh, they're grinding, right? They're, they're putting in long hours and you usually um, see, I don't know if it's glamorized is the right word, but you very often will see attorneys rushing to a courtroom or staying up late to, to file paperwork or to, um, I guess, take calls at all hours, right? And so we, we want to just talk about what that means. And that is maybe the end result, but what leads up to that? And is that something that we want to sustain? And think of those within your own professional ranks. And I realize as many of you grow and, and are placed in positions, um, maybe as executive directors, directing managers, <clears throat> that now the eyes are on you to set the tone, set the example, but also meet the needs of, of your legal organizations. So we want to take a look at the role mentorship and supervision can provide um, and where it can provide support, right? And where we can shift those norms. So I guess we'll move on to our first topic, professional culture and legal aid. So I'm going to um, quickly go on to the next slide. So what are some things that typically come up? So I've been around um, public interest law generally, indirectly, um, and maybe also working at diff in different legal environments. And some factors that definitely uh, show up, right, is contributing to the stressors that <laughs> exist in legal aid and really the legal profession in general, but more specifically um, when you're talking about public interest law is we are looking at long hours, unusually high uh, caseloads, and depending on the areas that you're working on, either complex needs, right? Things are complicated, complex, needing a lot of intervention and trauma, right? So, you know, oftentimes people don't think of economic issues as bringing on situations that will bring out a traumatic response. But you have to remember that food insecurity in unstable housing, things that you would associate with basic needs and not having them, right, can be very traumatizing. It's it's not always, you know, the physical or the sexual abuse or um, <clears throat> that type of trauma, although oftentimes it does um, show up in the work that we do. But we, we need to think about these other complexities, right, from a holistic lens, and you'll be working with these clients. So I always remind attorneys that like, while you will be providing many options for clients, given their particular needs and why they are showing up for services, um, you are also gonna, you know, be faced with the fact that some will not feel practical to your clients, right? And so these are, are complex. And looking at a client within a holistic framework um, paints a different picture than just one issue, which is oftentimes the one thing we can help with, right? Or the two things we can help with. Um, but if we start off the process with looking at it holistically, we'll see that there are a lot of factors leading up to the client showing up in your office, right? Or on the other end of the phone. Um, <clears throat> relatively low salaries. So we know that we have flight from public interest law um, because people need to pay back, you know, loans and the and the high cost of an education, and oftentimes, you know, looking for creative ways at at legal nonprofits to to make those salaries um, fair and enticing, um, and at least a living wage, right, so that attorneys can afford to have their families and. Um, their basic needs covered, right? But we know that sometimes, um, depending on the stage of life and how the planning and and luck, you know, would would have it, 
we see very good attorneys having to go on to different legal settings, right. That, um, offer, you know, um, just more ability to earn income. Then we also see high turnover. So because of the complex needs coupled with the things, right, that are going on, we know that it's hard for people to sustain. We also know, and I'll, I'll talk about some factors, that as the needs of the organization change to adapt, right, to whatever funding is out there, that sometimes um, individuals don't feel prepared or out of their depth, or maybe they're they're just out of law school, right? And they're learning, but there is a learning curve. And so it's really difficult. Um, and we see them just trying to hang in there, right? <laughs> While they learn new ways of doing this work. And then many of us experienced in this last year, you know, um, a lot of the COVID funding has dried up and new problems around housing have emerged and a lot of other cuts to funding. And we're all kind of feeling um, some of the, the pressure around that. So we want to, you know, not discount these as influences on how we do our work, right? And how we either can or cannot sustain some of these things, right? Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> there are many, there's an impact of these stressors in legal aid, right? And it starts, you know, innocuously sometimes, right? Stressful week, everybody goes out for happy hour. Or <clears throat> you need to get everything done. So you're staying up late. Maybe the boundaries are weak. Everybody talks about having good boundaries, right? But what does that look like? And how can you change the way that you do your work so that you can build in some buffers and also some expectations, right, for your client? So <clears throat> it's not, I think many of you struggle and, and thank you so much for your responses to the questions. But with that kind of fine line between having compassion and, and being open, right, and engaging with your client, and then also being so permeable sometimes that, you know, you're exposed to some of the trauma, right, and you're exposed to some of the hardship, and it, and it hits hard, and you want to take the call, but consistently taking calls is actually establishing behavior, right, you're reinforcing something that doesn't leave you both any better off, right, so and if you think of the calls that you get, start thinking backwards, right? So start thinking like, what information does the client need? And you're right. It, some of it could be an anxious response, right? Like we won't know till we go to court, like what the next step is, or we won't know um, <clears throat> just yet. And certain things are within our control. And there are other things that are outside of our control, right? And sometimes attorneys are like, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not a social worker. I'm not a therapist. And I feel like I'm wearing all these hats. Well, maybe also setting, setting the expectations early on. Right. Um, <clears throat> and the impact of these stressors can also, you know, have an impact somatically over time on our health. Right. So sitting long hours, back problems, um, not walking enough, um, not having time to rest or eat properly or exercise, obesity, right, which leads to could lead to other things like diabetes, <clears throat> not eating healthfully, drinking too much, maybe um, taking prescription painkillers, and then you real you know people numbing out. There, there's a range of these increased health risks, right, and some are particularly. Um, you know, troubling. Then we look at professional burnout. So burnout sometimes gets coupled in with trauma and secondary traumatic, you know, response or stressors. And so really what we need to think about is what is burnout, right? And how that presents itself in different settings, not just the legal, but most especially in the legal. And what that can mean is you've been at the same job 
in the same role. And while it's rewarding, you're not learning anything maybe too new or your role hasn't changed. And why this is particularly important for, you know, to consider around burnout is that <clears throat> you can't be exposed in the same way for extended duration and not expect it to have an impact. So, you know, I'll correlate it to something in my profession, right? When you start off, you have to cut your teeth and you need to get out there and get your hours and get licensed. And you have large caseloads again, and we have our version of billable hours, right? It's called productivity. <clears throat> and it doesn't feel very productive though, to be honest. Um, it's just, you know, th this kind of structure that's been set up um, but you know, that's where you learn, um, the tools of your trade. And as you're doing that, you're very exposed to trauma. You're very exposed to these complex needs and much in the way attorneys are early on, right? Cause they're also learning to manage their time and they're learning to set boundaries. <clears throat> but if we don't adapt and if we don't learn and we don't change, we stay exposed to those same stressors. So ideally you would go from working kind of in the trenches to maybe some different roles, maybe some supervisory roles, maybe some um, nuanced roles, right? Where you have some client contact and then you have some kind of macro lens on it, right? Doing some more policy work, um, working on committees, right? There's different ways um, to continue to do work in the field, in your particular area, but taking different roles on, right? So not as to constantly expose you. Um, also the way we do our work that I'll get to in a minute. So burnout occurs really across the board in a lot of professional set, a lot of settings, almost any job, right? We can see burnout, but a lot of it has to do with not having that shift, that change, that feeling uh, that you're having an impact and you sense it early on, right? Cause you're looking for it, but over time you can be worn out and you need a little break. You need a little shift. So be considering where that shows up for you and your, your work. Um, vicarious trauma. That's always a big ticker. When I, when I ask, you know, what do you want more trainings on? <laughs> so I was pleased to see many of you had had some trainings at least on vicarious trauma, right? And this is this exposure because unfortunately, the details that build your cases are these horrific stories that involve evidence that are pictures and voicemails and <clears throat> medical scarring and traumatic brain injury and so so a range of things, right? Or people being unhoused or living conditions that they've lived in, right? And, and you can't get those images out of your head, whether it was visually something that you, you've seen, if it's something you've heard, right? If it's the pain and anguish and fear and stress that you see in your client, it's really hard to remove that, right? And so then you'll find yourself worried late at night. You'll be having nightmares. <clears throat> you'll be unable to eat right? You'll start taking on some of these attributes. And the interesting thing, whether real or perceived, your body and your brain are responding in the same way, right? As if you had experienced it firsthand. So those of you who have attended different trainings in the past, <clears throat> our system, right? Our brain is set up to help us in times of trouble, right? We have an alert system and our body, body is flooded, our brain is flooded, right? With chemicals and our heart and our systems, right? Our somatic systems respond, right? Our heart beats faster, right? Or some of us shut down when we're overwhelmed, right? There is no one way to respond. Sometimes it's a combination, but the important part about this is that that stress response system is not intended to be constant. 
right? So if your client is coming in and you notice like they're not sleeping, they're not eating, they're having <clears throat> blackouts, they're experiencing different things, right? They're crying at the drop of a hat. You can't even get through and, and gather somebody's statement because it, they're so reactive to how they're feeling, right? It takes them back that we have to learn how to have those conversations. Um, we need to consider some different ways of approaching the work, right? These are the shifts we need to be thinking about. And in many of your responses, it's what you were not prepared for, right? It's it's what you either didn't have experience or you kind of had a vague idea of what it would be like. But then once you're in it, it's coming at you, right? And you just want the train to stop. So that's that's bad. Um a breakdown of support nets. So what we've heard and what we've seen in research and what we've, um, and I did leave some um, citations at the end that you'll, you can reference. Um, we do notice that there can be isolation in the work, right? Especially post COVID. Some of us work remotely, some are in hybrid situation or just your practice of doing the research, right? And looking through all your materials. If you get used to working in silos <clears throat> and that's how you do it and you do it for long hours, then you're gonna find that you've become very isolated, right? In the way that you do your work. Um, also, some new, new attorneys I've seen, you know, they learned their way that got them through law school and got them through, you know, being a summer clerk or got through, but then they get to, you know, the legal aid that kind of captures their heart and the heart work begins and they realize that they need to adapt, right? They need to start learning from their environment and their other mentors in that environment. And if we're not reaching out and connecting to the knowledge and resources that we have available, then those support nets break down. Um, I did not list the stats on this, but <clears throat> anybody can tell you, if you go to grad school and you're in a relationship or married, it puts a lot of strain on that relationship, right? And it doesn't get easier as you're trying to build families and and um, get out and doing the work over the course, it can be very stressful. And division of labor issues come up and long hours have an impact. And with <clears throat> more women having entered the profession, right? We, we have to have more egalitarian models of figuring out that division of labor, but those long hours, whether by one partner or the other, can't be sustained, right? Unless there's some give and take and some um, focused attention on how to maintain this work-life balance. So with those breakdown of support nets, um, we start seeing the long-term effects of those stressors, right? And then how many stay in, right? Not just legal aid, but law. I mean, in general, right? It's especially pronounced when you're looking at public interest law. Um, it's very, very, very challenging because people's health takes a toll, right? They start developing anxiety, depression, and maybe some other uh, stressors that are the antithesis of wellness, right? So we wanna really look at this environment and these practices and what has been normed for us because Many still kind of, I hear it sometimes. I don't know if it's like a badge of honor, but I also hear like people like really tired, like, I don't know how long I'm going to do this, or I'm only going to do this until I can pay off my student loans. Right. And that breaks my heart. These are really, really great people, but we need to make sure that we all are taking care of ourselves and supporting one another so that we can continue to do this work. It's, it's very important work and we can't afford to be, we cannot afford to be losing um, individuals within our ranks. Next slide, please. So how do we adapt these, pack <laughs> these practices, right? Let's look at the bright side. <clears throat> Let's move on to the next, thank you. 
So these are opportunities. These are just some things. There, there are many, <clears throat> but these are ones that we can think about, some that we can start thinking about today, or at least doing an assessment and thinking about whether or not we have the capacity presently, whether or not we need a trauma-informed organizational assessment, whether or not we need to be taking some surveys of our folks that are working for us <clears throat> and holding that um, as a balance, right? Also taking surveys, how we're serving our clients, right? So we pretty much know that a well-supportive staff is going to be more capable of addressing the needs of the varied needs of our clients that come in to our practices. So addressing mission ambiguity and developing specialization. So <clears throat> many of us work for legal aids, if we're tiny, um, that do like one thing or they deal with one um, population within the community. Um, others <clears throat> are larger legal aids and they have the capability of maybe um, legally in-house having different departments that deal with a variety of needs that might come up holistically for a client, right? And so non-dependent on our size, <laughs> if we have a specialization, if we have a main area of focus, we are less likely to suffer from mission creep, right? And some people have heard about this and, and some people use different terminology to describe it. <clears throat> but a lot of times we're chasing the funding because we rely on grants, we rely on this funding and they're serving a population or a type of work or a, so <clears throat> instead of keep, you know, if we keep on shifting our mission, what does that do for the people working within the org? Well, first of all, if you're just new and starting out, it's probably good to have mentors that have years of experience in that area to learn from, right? And also it's good <clears throat> if you're being brought on for your area of specialty, that they not change that <laughs> on you because you're not gonna be maybe as effective or you're not gonna feel um, like they're using you for your strengths, right? In your body of knowledge. So <clears throat> that's something we can do. We can look like, have we done this historically? Do we not do this? But this is more of our practices, right? Like, how do we go after this funding? Um, moving to a more inclusive, collaborative, and creative uh, pedagogy. So when we're talking about the field of legal aid, <clears throat> I would say in past trainings, um, I've asked individuals, why did you join this field? Or why this particular um, practice or, you know, what was your motivating factor? And for some of them, they said, I wanted to go back to the communities that I came from, or I identify with this, or this impacted me, or I see what a global issue this is. This, this affects everybody, <clears throat> all human beings. <clears throat> but in this over the years, as the doors have been swung more wide open and we get more of a variety of practitioners, right? Legal practitioners. Like we have attorneys out there that come from all walks of life. And it's really important to start being more inclusive of all those voices and lived experiences. And the reason it's important is that <clears throat> many people will hear this, representation matters. Now, it's not, you know, I, I'm one Latina. I'm just one version of a Latina. But some people probably might not figure out like what I am right off, right? I like to blend. <laughs> I like to be the fly on the wall. But I very much am a Latina. So because of that, you know, this idea of cultural competence is a fallacy. You know one person and having client-specific services and culturally responsive services that allow a client first perspective um, really allows us to meet clients where they're at. And we forego this idea of competence. You cannot possibly <clears throat> be competent in all factors impacting segments of our population that have some unifying right attributes. What we can do though, 
is be responsive in a way where we meet clients where they're at. And when we say that, it can be anything from an accessibility issue. If your services are accessible, then they will be accessible to all. So looking at that through a different, from a shift to a lens, you're not making an exception, you're shifting your practice, right? To now <clears throat> start dismantling those barriers and having voices, right? Within our own professions that reflect the communities that we're serving, right? Or the range of communities that we serve. And if we break down some old hierarchical patterns, then <clears throat> we then address those issues of isolation, mentorship, some of these other things that are set up in older ways that are not responding to current trends, current needs, or what is now right? And we know change takes time, but maybe we can't afford time in these areas. Maybe some of these are changes we can do right now. We want to consider the best solution to clients needs may require a non-legal solution. <clears throat> so I really love that at LACLJ, we have a holistic assessment. And what this means is we have social workers at service community advocates and attorneys conducting these um, assessments, right? And we're looking at many factors that impact a client's legal case. So knowing if they have stable housing, knowing if, you know, they have income and knowing if they have children that have, say, special needs, kn knowing if they have access needs, right? Right. All of these things are particularly important because it's going to impact the level at which the client's going to engage with their attorney and participate in the legal matter and benefit from the legal outcomes at the end of the case, right? So there, it's multifactorial if you looked at, look at it, right? <clears throat> You're looking at all these issues and it's very, very important to realize Maybe the best solution, they come in for an assessment, a legal assessment, and you're like, I'm not sure I can help you in this area, but you identify some areas where they could be assisted and linking them to those services might be more helpful than the legal route. I know it's amazing, right? <clears throat> or a different legal route. <laughs> so say they're coming to you for one thing, but you realize that's not our specialty um, nor is it maybe the best way to address the issue, right? So we sometimes see this um, with youth. Say you're serving um, a population of those under 18 or under 22 <laughs> who might be in school <clears throat> and might need therapy. And they're coming in, I don't know, say they're part, they're coming in and there's something that's happening with say a divorce or something you know, say it's DV related, you know, or it could be anything, right? Pick any topic, but say the child is impacted. Is the best route to go through the school district? Is it best to go through, you know, um, <clears throat> a private attorney? Do they qualify for pro bono services, right? Looking at it from multiple lenses, but you may have heard this, right? You go to a surgeon, the solution is going to be a surgical approach, but not always do you need to address it one way. Maybe there's another way that's less traumatic for the client and maybe for yourselves, right? So it's important to be creative and knowing what's out there and continuing to expand that network. You all are here attending this training. That's, you know, one step, you know, in a direction that's going to offer you more solutions rather than fewer. All right. Um, looking and developing systems of support in multi or transdisciplinary models of practice. So um, when I first came to work for my legal aid, <clears throat> my legal org, there was somebody um, that, you know, was helping direct a lot of the services at the time. And she happened to be an MSWJD. Now, luckily, she had kind of this vision right? And I had come from an org, um, from, from a dependency setting, actually, where, again, they were looking at the intersection of law and social work. 
What's really beneficial <clears throat> when you have these multidisciplinary, like medical models have a lot of different disciplines working together, um, is that the attorneys don't have to wear other hats for which they were not trained, right? And so figuring out if whether in-house or within your communities, you can identify these resources and create these partnerships, it takes the pressure off of an attorney that's maybe working an 80 hour work week, let's drop that down. <laughs> let's refer this part out that is not legal in nature, or let's learn, learn how the solution is being addressed and decide whether or not we wanna bring in some of these services so that it's integrated or maybe separate, but under the same roof, right? There's ways to look at this, but yes, I, I always joke, I always say that you know, our attorneys that work in legal aid are honorary social workers because you meet the work with such great compassion. And I would say you are looking for holistic responses, right? Not just legal, but many of you feel at a loss because you need these other tools, these other skill sets. And while some overlap, some are a little bit more difficult, right? And so it's something to consider. Um, we want to reimagine organizational values that include well-being and trauma-informed framework. So <clears throat> I was just saying at the beginning of this training, the fact that the legal profession now is looking at the subheading, this area where they're listening to the attorneys, right, that are saying, we need some help. We would like some training and support in this area. I think that's really great <clears throat> that we're seeing that trend. Also, it's important to look at your orgs and assessing where are we on this continuum? Where can we grow? We know that it is not going to happen overnight. And we know as many of our cases, right? You pull a thread and it starts to unravel, but it's better to know where the blind spots are, where the areas of ad added value or the, the quick fixes, right? Like what is something we can do today? What is something we can bring up in our next meeting? And assessment really is a good place to start. And in the past training, I did offer um, some resources on how to assess your orgs for trauma-informed legal services. And I might make sure uh, to send that along with Kasha so that those of you that didn't get a chance to attend that training also have that added resource, okay? But <clears throat> really, that's a great place to start. It's not always, um, being trauma-informed is not always just like bringing out a yoga mat, although that could be great, right? It can also mean deconstructing um, old patterns, right? Set up by old institutional systems, right? If we think of it, they weren't very inclusive, right? They didn't include women or people of color, they didn't really expand um, beyond the foundational, right? And those foundations are really important, but is it meeting our needs? And are we working collectively as well as we could? And, you know, I would argue we don't, if we don't hear all voices and we don't see all manners of work represented, right? Um, and the way we approach the work. We need to dismantle some of these older systems. And we need to acknowledge that certain individuals doing the work side by side with us might be experiencing things a little differently than we are, right? And so, and that's true of all people, right? All human beings, we all have different lived experience, but understanding at different times, they might be carrying a heavy burden at that time, right? And it's very impactful when we can reflect back that we acknowledge that, right? That we create space for a shift. Um, we want to invest in professional visioning. What does that mean, right? This new uh, terminology to bring out the strengths and motivators in your team. Well, we have professional reviews, right? We have periodic reviews of our performance. How are we performing? But oftentimes, What's not included is what would you like to do? Where would you like to be headed? What are the skill sets that you're going to need to get to where you want to be? 
this is going to prevent that burnout, right? This particular visioning practice, um, looking for opportunities. If you can't, if you don't know where you're going to go, or you have no vision for this, and you're working professionally with your supervisor, it needs to come up. And maybe one of your goals is having a consistent wellness point on your agenda when you're checking in with your with your supervisor, right? Maybe some of you are more, you know, private, you don't want to get into details, <clears throat> but you know that your family life might have an ebb, or, ebb and a flow. You might know if a family member is sick at that particular time, you might want to give them you know, some information about where you're at so they can best support you. And we know that traditionally saying like, I have a mental health need at this time is really scary because out of one side of our mouths, we sometimes say, oh, we need to remove stigma. But sometimes when we're doing the work, we hear, how do we work with individuals with mental health? They're so challenging right? And we need to reframe our language around that. They're experiencing a challenge. They're experiencing a barrier, right? We have to be careful because if we're so limited in the way that we view how they're ex having this experience, how do we feel when we need the support in a professional capacity, right? So we talk about how do we protect ourselves? How do we protect our clients? How do we how do we have this balanced approach? Well, the same rules have to apply, the same dignity and respect, the same humanity with which we approach our clients with compassion, we need to extend to ourselves, right? And there's ways to check in because your supervisor, you may or may not have a harmonious working relationship, but short of being, you know, you're not going to have to be buddy, buddy. But if you have an office culture, a work culture, a professional culture that supports professional development, then hopefully your org will be choosing those leaders, right? And we need to be reflective of that. We need to also acknowledge. So I really love that in social work, we've had discourse around supervision. And when we're working with different power differentials and when people look differently than we do in supervision, whether it's an age dynamic, a gender bias, right? Um, whatever may be occurring, you know, addressing it is, is a good thing usually, right? With support. Um, I might go ahead and send um, along some materials around um, a training in some of the work one of my colleagues had done in this area. Again, for those of you looking for anti-racist approach uh, to some of this work, which is important to sustain the work, we need everybody contributing to this work, right? And it's important that we make room for many different voices because we have many different clients with many different needs, right? So one of us hopefully will be able to be there. Um, we want to review practices and strategies that consistently require billing 60 plus hours of work. I mean, <clears throat> I'm happy to say that a lot of uh, nonprofits are shifting to a 35 hour work week, or they have other policies that build in wellness time. <clears throat> but if we have that on one side, and we're still looking at 60 plus hours of work a week, <clears throat> we need to start trending. And so what is that going to look like? Now, will there be periods where we all have to pull together grant reporting, you know, long cases, closing out cases before the end of the year? <clears throat> Lots of things come up, a, a particularly, you know, complex case that comes up, right? We have all hands on deck. There will be periods we all have to be there, right? And put in a little extra. But the ex expectation that we sustain that is really going to be unrealistic, right? So um, we really, we really need to look at some of the, the data. And I would say <clears throat> I did attach um, some resources at the end or some citations where they are talking about ways to broach this topic with management um, and also 
talking about some of these strategies. This particular recording will be recorded. Maybe you can invite them um, to go ahead and watch and see where, if only at an assessment, someplace to begin, right? But I would be curious how many hours, right? And is this the norm? And is it a badge of honor? Or is it a goal like that we want, is there a goal we want to work on, right? And obviously it might look different. If you're just at a law school, you know, learning the ropes, there is a learning curve. You might be grinding a little harder at first because you're learning, right? <clears throat> but the expectation to maintain or sustain that is really going to be dangerous for everybody over the long haul. Sleep deprivation, right? is not good. <laughs> um, we, we have, and then obviously the other, the other factors that I'll get to at the very end, um, are not good, right? How do people cope with this level of stress? Stress kills. <laughs> we know this, right? Maybe we could start that <laughs> discussion with our, with our managers and directors, like stress kills <laughs> period. It's a fact right? There's a lot of data out there and why we act like it's not there and that it's still a badge of honor is very dangerous. You know, I get <clears throat> that there aren't enough hours in the day to probably represent one client, right? I'm sure there's a lot we can do, but we need to manage expectations and I think it's managed for us. We're like, this is the body of work we can do. This is what we have capacity to do. And we need to then communicate clear, uh, realistic um, management of expectations. Like we can take this part of the work. We're not going to be able to handle that part of the work. I know that's something that we oftentimes have to say in our, in our jobs, right? One person cannot humanly take on <clears throat> crazy caseloads. Right. And we need to look at the practice. Maybe there's a day where you're not taking statements from a client, where you are doing notes or you're doing research, but you're not having direct client contact. Right. There needs to be some buffer periods in there. This ebb and this flow. This is where we're going to get a little bit of balance. Right. And, and we're working on it. I mean, everybody's not perfect, but we need to be reassessing. Providing protective strategies through training and mentorship. So <clears throat> I'm happy to say these trainings are more regular and um, LAC has done a great time, you know, job at getting them on calendar. And there are a lot of resources out there. I know I'm always out there trying to do my part, but I'm just one. I've heard some really great trainings out there and would really, really encourage you uh, to think about who on your staff can do that. Um, my particular, um, you know, LACLJ, made the commitment to having somebody with my background in training on staff to provide trainings um, <clears throat> and to also help out with our interns. We have social work interns. So again, we don't expect our attorneys to be social workers. Um, there are certain commitments, right, that are made, but over the long haul, it has been a positive for clients and for staff. Is it perfect? It's never perfect. But do we strive and do we have more resources to do the work collectively? Yes. And I would like to think of us as more transdisciplinary. And it's taken a while, right? But better to start the journey today than not to have started it at all. That's that's the worst harm. All right, next slide, please. So preparation for sustainable careers. We're going to move on to the next. Okay. <laughs> so building a foundation and investing in a future. <clears throat> so I have to tell you, I'll self-disclose here. <clears throat> I was trying to decide where do I want to go? Um, what kind of graduate degree do I want? And I was a political science undergrad. I thought I love international law. That really appealed to me. <clears throat> so after getting my MSW, I was like, okay, well, no, I ended up deciding to get an MSW, but after getting, um, you know, going to UCLA and saying, okay, I think I want to do law. I went to open houses that interested me. One was an MBA program. I was looking at nonprofit management and running a nonprofit. The other uh, was a social work uh, degree. 
and for obvious reasons, you know, doing the advocacy piece of it. Um, and then the last one was actually showing up to law school open houses. <clears throat> and the ones, the work that appealed to me were those programs that had public interest law components. So I've been looking kind of at this landscape for a while. And I have to tell you the distinct differences in culture when you show up to the open houses. So I don't know if you guys can hearken back <clears throat> or if it was just like yesterday that uh, you feel like you were recruited or that you showed up at an open house. But, um, you know, it was more like a beer garden, <laughs> right? And <clears throat> there was a lot of ways in which people connected and discussed the work. Now, was it all beer garden? No, it was not. Um, but was that an element? Yes, it was. And it was present not only in, you know, in various ways, um, in different graduate program experiences when they have meet and greets. Um, and maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe it lowers inhibitions. Maybe it's still a practice, right, to meet after work for a drink. Um, but when you're looking at these practices, what role do some of these practices play? Not just in the like, hi, welcome phase, but ongoing, right? And so I've been pleased to see more like wellness events, more people getting together, more family forward events, more like uh, team building events. And <clears throat> I, in my previous life, I got to team build with Anderson um, Business School at UCLA. And we would take them out into the environment and they'd bring together teams and we did some team building, right? There were different ways to approach our getting to know one another, our ideas around how we care for ourselves <clears throat> as we're going through even applying to graduate school, right? There were a lot of forums. Um, I was online. I think I was on a forum for people that were applying to Wharton you know, at the time, there was a lot of grind, grind, grind mentality. And yes, it's hard, right? I mean, you're studying for the LSAT, you're, you know, it's, it's no joke. When I drove up to take my LSAT, the song that was playing was Under Pressure by Queen and David Bowie. And boy, was that an apropos song. I mean, you feel it, right? So it was hard taking all these entrance exams and then having to decide where do I want to go with this? Right. Um, but ultimately I think I was looking at the culture and I do have, um, you know, I did have a young child. And so I really, really, really needed to consider that. So we need to look at where we are, right. Where people are when they're going to get these degrees. Um, So yes, yes, yes. Um, I'm sorry, I was just taking a little pause there. Then, so it's it's important to look at how we're gonna be entering these fields, right? How do we enter the experience? And then changing the landscape of professionals and lived experience, right? So I mentioned this earlier, we're welcoming people that don't look like the attorneys of yesteryear, right? Into the profession, um, it appeals to different individuals for different reasons now. There's a lot of social justice issues that come up. Um, and so balancing, you know, the work that you're doing, that compassion satisfaction. So for those of you um, who haven't heard of the ProQual, it's one of the only tools where you are checking in on the stuff that you love about the work that you do and you're balancing it with the stressors, right? So you need to have those realistic expectations. We need to be fast forwarding and talking about that with those entering the profession, learning how to have difficult conversations. So in a training I'll be doing next week, I'm going to be honing in on that one thing. So what I've noticed is so many people are uncomfortable having those conversations. And sometimes they can even feel scary um, because human beings are at the edge of, edge of the rope, right? And sometimes we're on the edge ourselves. Understanding and changing language around trauma. So I hearkened to this earlier, you know, we can't use words like competence. We can never be competent entirely. We need to be thinking about 
um, trauma as the individual experience it. Let's ask them, what do they feel is the most traumatizing thing? Let's not presuppose. So that's something to know about. Um, we also need to change our languages, you know, working with clients with challenging behaviors. We've heard this. No, we need to recognize what trauma looks like and understand that these are skills that they develop to get their needs met, right? It's not meant, they're not, you know, steeped in, in this. This is how they're getting their needs met. We can model, we can reflect, we can see this is difficult. We can let them know what we can do. Right. And so I'll be focusing in on some of that uh, next week and then developing resources within the legal community. So this is a great place to come for your trainings. I mean, I am blown away by and, and I've attended some other ones. I know I was looking, I think, the previous week or so, um, you know, I've seen some done um, by MHOS and amazing right around mental health. So we, we need to be talking about these and attending these and bringing them in-house when we can, um, and then figuring out who in your community, whether it's going to be in-house or in your immediate resources, we need to develop those lists and share with one another, right? Um, definitely breaking down barriers to accessibility. Next slide, please. All right. So I talked a little bit about this, so if we can move on to the next. So we need models, right? We need models that either look like us, who are living the way we want to live, who are working, who have that balance, who have sustained themselves in legal aid, right? So that's what we need. Um, we need to place a premium on health. So what does that look like? That le looks like few less absenteeism. We, we need people taking their vacations. We need people having resources and a plan before a problem happens, having those wellness plans, doing self-assessments, checking in on wellness with their supervisors. That's what it looks like. Organizational leadership strategies. Start with that trauma-informed assessment, organizational assessment. I will be giving that to Kasha, or she may already have it in her compendium, and maybe we can upload that. Understanding the direct trauma work isn't for everybody, right? There may be other roles you can take if you start finding like, this is not for me. Thinking about mentorship as part of preparation before, during, and after leaving the profession. Those of you who have been in this profession, we need you. We need you to act as those role models. We need you to be able to talk about how things were and what worked and what didn't work. We need you as you're leaving law school, if you've just left, think of those people that were mentors to you. Maybe they won't be the same person to take you to the next part of your career, but definitely connect. Do not isolate. Okay. Those are some takeaways to help keep you healthy and well as you do this work. Next slide, please. All right. So um, some real st sobering statistics, right? Um, we see that there are a lot of lawyers in the United States that experience depression, anxiety, stress, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, right? And I did list the category. I also cited the article. If you care to kind of dive deep, if you know somebody, if you want to bring attention at your org, we also want to protect um, attorneys from experiencing suicidal ideation. So that was also um, described. We are so fortunate in California to have the other bar. They, there is confidential peer support available. Many others um, are relying on figuring out what their mental health care plan looks like. I encourage you to find that out. Figure out how, what that looks like to navigate. It's very different, but there should be somebody at your organization can let you know. We also have the EOP and EAP programs um, that sometimes can be provided through your employer. But if this mental health area has not been flushed out, make it a priority, an anonymous note, figure out how you can provide that feedback, that much needed, very essential feedback. And in conclusion, if you would like to reach out to myself um, or LACLJ on the next slide or the last slide, here are your resources. <laughs> and then on the very last, oh, I wanted to call attention. Um, sorry, Abby. Um, there are some that are really great. 
but there is this great article here, um, Women in the Profession Balance Lives, Changing the Culture of Legal Practice. I was really, I really love that. They came out the year that my son was born, right? So 22 some odd years ago, and uh, now 24, I guess 23, it'll be 23 years ago. Um, I can do math, I promise. Um, it was really, really, really sobering to me. And I love that word sobering. It was like, wow, you know, how much the changing landscape and the changing faces in legal aid have impacted the way we all benefit or we can all be hurt um, by the practices that we employ. So I'd just like to thank you in conclusion. Now we can go to the last slide, Abby. Um, that's my information down below. If you'd like to email me directly, if not, you can reach out to LACLJ. Um, if you would like us to maybe help um, with a training, um, Abigail Abby is online with us today and um, she's our accessibility coordinator but she is also the person that, that gathers info from your orgs if you feel that you could benefit from a targeted um, you know, training in this area. We'd be happy to help out. Well, thank you so much again for your time. Thank you, Kasha. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. This webinar was hosted by the Legal Aid Association of California, also known as LAC. We are the membership organization for California civil legal aid nonprofits. Our job is to advocate in the legislature, in the courts, and with the State Bar of California on behalf of the community of nonprofits that serve low income Californians. In addition to our online and in-person trainings, LAC provides coordination and advocacy for increased funding to support organizations like yours. Thank you.